And okay, uh, we have here Flavia Colonna from George Mason University. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation. And that's it, you can go ahead. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm delighted to be speaking. Uh, although, you know, a, a, a physical uh, conference is much more satisfying or seminar or having the opportunity to talk to people. But I'm really, really grateful to, to be able to do this. Um, okay, so let me quickly uh, tell you a little bit about what um, the topic I wish to discuss is. I don't know exactly the audience, so this is more like a series of ideas behind um, the work that I gave to one of my uh, former uh, PhD students um, that was uh, um, came about uh, from the following consideration. And, you know, people have been working on um, Banach spaces, analytic functions, and operators acting on them for a long time, and a, a, a series of books and lots and lots of papers have been written on, on this subject. And so one um, uh, idea was, okay, so how about spaces of harmonic functions? What is known about them? So I did as a um, uh, research to, uh, to the student, um, you know, to try to find out what had been done in this area. And I discovered that surprisingly, uh, not much had been done. Um, yeah, at least in terms of the operators acting on them. And so the idea was, okay, there are all these other important results that um, uh, have been uh, considered um, and uh, improved by many mathematicians. So what, uh, how are these results um, um, translated into the case in which this space spaces instead of consisting analytic functions or uh, harmonic functions. In other words, can these uh, same results hold? So that was the starting point. Then we looked at the uh, suitable operators. I, I'm, I have been working for many, many years on uh, mostly weighted composition operators. And, and this class, which is a, a, a composition product of multiplication with uh, composition operators, isn't really that suitable. Um, for a harmonic function because harmonicity, whenever there is a multiplicative uh, action, uh, is not preserved. And so for this reason, we had to narrow it down to the case of composition operators, which is uh, the, um, for which there is a lot, the largest amount of literature um, to refer back to. Um, okay, so uh, the, the, uh, let me quickly, uh, oops, first failure of the day. What happened here? I don't know what happened. The zoom went. Okay. So uh, maybe. Okay. Let me see if this is now working well. Is this a size okay? In or is it uh, not? Yeah, no, the size okay. is great. Uh, it may be easier for you to, if you put it on full screen, because just changing slides would be easier. Okay, but then. At least uh, the size is great. Let's see. Unfortunately, I have a lot of things here that are covering the commands. Okay, let me switch over to a different. Uh, this is the one. Is the one in the okay, let me uh, change. I don't know. To, maybe the the button oh, next to the, the magnifier. Tech, the tech one, and so I want to do a different share. So let me okay. share this one instead. Now this is Acrobat Reader. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, better, uh, except I don't want to start from the last page. Oops. This is not what I was meaning to show. Uh, sorry about that failure. Okay, so here. And go oh, to page one. Okay, and um, so let's see full screen. Okay, so hopefully
hopefully it will pop up here. Okay. Okay, so this is um, a joint work with... Um, Sorry, I, I don't know if the others are seeing, but I, I only see a black screen. Are the others seeing just the black screen as well? Oh. Yes. Yes, okay. Okay. Um, let me know if I, if I have to switch it back. Okay, so let me quickly um, move some of these icons elsewhere because they're really interfering with my ability to see. You can see that I'm not an expert on this. Okay. Um, so, uh, no, the, so I don't, uh, I don't know if you understand. There's only a black screen. We cannot see anything. I'm not sure what. I think before you put on full screen, it was fine. But now that you put on full screen, Let me go it's back just a then. black screen. Well, yeah, this we try. can see. Yes. Okay. Sorry. This is the best I can do. The full yeah, screen, this full screen feature apparently is not working very well. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so this is joint work with Munira Al Jouaid, who uh, graduated in 2019 and uh, is now uh, at the University of Northern Borders in Saudi Arabia. So, um, the um, the work that we uh, started dealing with was as follows. Suppose, first of all, uh, we consider the harmonic mapping. So a harmonic mapping on a domain, the uh, omega in, in the complex plane is a complex valued function on omega, which satisfies the Laplace equation, um, uh, uh, which can be written in terms of the um, uh, complex partial derivatives as uh, HZZ bar equal to zero, where the operators uh, the map uh, function H to H sub Z and H sub Z bar are defined below in terms of the corresponding partial derivatives with respect to X and Y. And then it's obvious that a harmonic a function on omega uh, can be expressed uh, as a sum of a, an analytic function f plus the conjugate of an analytic function. Um, and uh, this representation is uh, unique up to a constant. Uh, and so if we can make it unique if we fix uh, a point in the domain and require, for instance, that the uh, the function g uh, maps z0 to 0, uh, where z0 is the point of reference. Uh, clearly, then, uh, we, we uh, see that the um, um, uh, partials of h with respect to z and z bar are precisely the derivative of the analytic uh, part and the uh, conjugate of the derivative of the anti-analytic part. And, uh, so what we will be discussing here is the case when omega is the open unit disk D. use the notation h of d for the uh, collection of analytic functions on d and uh, uh, script h of d for the harmonic counterparts. Well, obviously, the, uh, the space of an, uh, the set of analytic functions is a subset of the set of harmonic functions. And so uh, one uh, question, main question that um, we uh, wanted to uh, come up with was, or answer was, uh, given a, a, a Banach space of analytic functions on the disk, uh, is there a way we can define a norm in a natural way on an, ex, on the ex, on an extension uh, of, uh, the, of the space uh, that are called x sub h, um, consisting of uh, harmonic mappings in such a way that the uh, restriction to the uh, analytic functions is the given uh, space X 
and in such a way that the norms are the same on the, OL, on, on the analytic function. And, and do operators that act on, on these two spaces behave the same way? So those were the questions we were trying to explore. And, um, and so what the, the plan about today's lecture is going to be to um, first uh, do an overview of uh, classical spaces of analytic functions um, with specific ones uh, that we treat in particular, and then um, highlight some of their um, main features that we tried to see if they were it was possible to extend to the harmonic case, then uh, give the, the extensions in the in the sense of what we were trying to determine, and then uh, discuss of the, the composition operators acting on them. Um, now, the uh, most well-known uh, spaces of analytic functions are per perhaps the uh, Harley space HP, which is defined as a collection of all analytic functions on the disk, whose uh, uh, norm uh, is defined as the supremum of the average value of the peak power of the modulus raised to the one over p over all uh, radii um, inside the disk. And, uh, and H infinity is the, the space of uh, bounded analytic functions on the disk endowed with a soup norm. The Bergman space uh, AP is defined in, uh, as. Love you? Yes. Just, sorry, just a second. In which page in the slides are you? I'm at page uh, six. I Six, because here it still shows you're in five. I think it's not changing the page. Hmm. Then I have to go back and change instead of using this. Yeah, I apologize for that. I, no, no, I understand. Let me see. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay, so we're still, I'll use this instead. It's, it was easier to deal with the other, but this is, you're, you're now oh, okay. Seeing, no, okay. Now it's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, maybe I should put this down so that there is no temptation to work on that. That's easier because it's, it's it scrolls more easily. But this is probably the this was the reason why I had to switch because the uh, full screen wasn't working when I first used this. Okay. Um, so then the uh, space, the Bergman space AP is defined as a collection of functions, uh, analytic, oops, this is, should be regular H, um, uh, analytic on the disk, uh, whose, um, which, whose piece power is integrable over the disk uh, against the um, area measure and with the norm defined in, 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 uh, in terms of this integral. So those are the most well-known examples. And the cases P equal to two are famous also because they are Hilbert spaces. Uh, another space that has been uh, thoroughly studied is the space of uh, BMOA of analytic functions of bounded mean oscillation, which is defined as, um, as a uh, the collection of functions analytic on the disk whose radial limits belong to the uh, space BMO of the boundary. Right. And their norm is defined uh, in terms of this um, um, H2 uh, norm of uh, the translates of F um, by means of a uh, Mobius transformation, the automorphic, disk automorphism that interchanges a point A to zero. Um, and um, or I think they're called uh, compressions. And, uh, and it can be viewed as the Mobius invariant version of the space H2. Now, an, an alternative um, norm on this space is uh, below. It's a, um, defined as a supremum overall A and D of A integral over d of the uh, modulus of the derivative quantity squared times one minus the same uh, uh, modulus of automorphism um, 
is available above uh, against area measure um, raised to the one half. Okay, these are equivalent norms. So these have been uh, studied uh, and now there are others which are going to be more the focus on what we will be discussing, which are uh, the uh, so-called growth space. Um, it's a collection of um, analytic functions um, which, uh, which uh, whose um, um, point evaluation function, so if you take the, uh, uh, apply to them, is bounded by uh, one over one minus modulus of z squared raised to the power alpha, or it, this is the, the way they are defined. So there is this uh, Bergman weight, one minus modulus of z squared to the alpha times the uh, modulus of the function. And, and so the, the norm is defined in this manner. And these are balance spaces. And, um, and they've been studied thoroughly. Uh, and they are um, also uh, related to another class of spaces, which are uh, the uh, so-called alpha block spaces. Those are defined by um, uh, means of a supremum of the same type of weight, uh, and, and, but the function is replaced by its derivative. So that obviously then uh, the elements of the uh, alpha block space are uh, derivative, uh, are those whose derivative is in, in, in the uh, uh, growth space. Then uh, to make uh, a norm, we need to uh, uh, make sure that the constants are uh, taken care of. Uh, and so we have to add this term uh, modulus of f of zero to this quantity, which is a, a semi-norm. Uh, a special case where alpha, uh, alpha is one is the uh, so-called block space, it's, uh, which has uh, been studied for a long time. And, and the, um, function theory on the block space goes back into, would say, um, early 70s or even before then. Um, and it, it's, it's well known that it's the largest Mobius invariant Banach space. Um, one of the uh, results that I obtained when I first started um, um, after I graduated was to uh, uh, notice that the uh, functions in the block space are precisely the functions which are Lipschitz when uh, they are regarded as maps between the uh, hyperbolic disk, um, whereby hyperbolic disk we mean a unit disk together with the Poincaré metric. Um, and uh, into C together with Euclidean metric. And in fact, the, uh, what I call here the Lipschitz number LF, defined as the supremum of the ratio between F of Z minus F of W uh, to rho of ZW over all Z and equal to W is, um, pre turns out to be precisely the same as the um, uh, semi-norm defined on the previous page. Um, this then became part of the folklore because it was this result, it was actually uh, appeared uh, uh, some uh, short times after, time afterwards in uh, a, a book by uh, Kehe Zhu, uh, who in, in 1993 started working on a larger class of spaces uh, known as the alpha block spaces. And so they are defined um, before, but he was, he was able to do was uh, notice that um, the uh, case alpha equal to one was um, is different from the case when alpha is between zero and one and alpha is bigger than one. And he came up with characterization of uh, these spaces um, of which one, the, the one uh, actually both in different ways, uh, can be uh, characterized by means of a Lipschitz type condition. So the one for the case when alpha is between zero and one is 
what we can call the uh, lip one minus alpha. So it uh, has a similar flavor as the one that I uh, outlined above for the case of the block space. Uh, but the uh, uh, Poincare metric is replaced by modulus of z minus w to the one minus alpha. Whereas for alpha bigger than one, uh, the space is, uh, can be identified with the growth spaces relative to the uh, parameter alpha minus one. So these, these were all in this paper by Zhu in, uh, in uh, 1993. Then another space that we looked at was the classical Zygmunt space, um, which is discussed at length in, um, uh, in the uh, book by uh, Peter Duran on, on Hardy spaces. Uh, and it's defined as the class of functions analytic on the disk whose extension to the unit circle satisfy a, um, this type of smoothness condition. So the uh, radial limits um, to the boundary uh, when taking the modulus of e to the i uh, theta plus alpha plus uh, uh, of a function at e to the i theta plus alpha, alpha plus the value at e to the i theta minus alpha minus twice the value at e to the i theta, all divided by alpha, uh, and uh, taking the supremum over all theta and all alpha positive um, is finite. So this smoothness condition makes the, the, the collection of such uh, analytic functions um, in the uh, disk algebra. And in fact, more than that, uh, they, these functions are continuous to the closed disk. Um, and one of the uh, issues about this definition is that it's, they are not easy to characterize. So if you're dealing with a function in the Zygmunt space and you need some better uh, criteria to determine whether or not uh, any candidate will belong to the space. And so uh, Zygmunt was uh, proved that it, uh, a function f is in the Zygmunt space if and only if the second derivative of f um, modulus uh, multiplied by one minus modulus of z squared is finite, which is, uh, of course, equivalent to saying that the derivative uh, is in the block space, according to what I defined before. And so then this became the standard way people thought of the Zygmunt space in, in the subsequent papers, uh, because this is an easy thing to test out. Um, and the norm, which is equivalent to the um, semi-norm defined by means of F star above, uh, is defined in terms of the suprema. Um, other classes of spaces of interest are the uh, base of spaces. So there are two types of base of spaces. For p bigger than one, they are defined in terms of the um, um, uh, integral of the derivative raised to the p uh, against a, a measure area measure, which is not the, uh, times this term, one minus modulus of z uh, squared raised to the p minus two, which is equivalent to saying that if we incorporate uh, the uh, uh, piece of this uh, uh, weight uh, by considering the measure d mu equal to dA of z divided by one minus modulus of z squared quantity squared, uh, then the, the derivative of the functions in, in, the, um, uh, in the base of space BP uh, multiplied by one minus modulus of Z squared belongs to the space LP of D mu. Okay, so that's another uh, uh, space of interest, which is uh, Mobius invariant. Um, and the norm is defined also in a similar fashion by uh, uh, taking the modulus of f of zero plus this um, um, semi-norm, take the pit uh, pa uh, uh, root of this integral above. Now, interesting fact is, oops, uh, is that B2 is um, 
endowed with an equivalent norm is the uh, classical Dirichlet space B, because we lose the weight entirely. Uh, and the uh, norm is um, uh, defined as the uh, square root of the modulus of f at zero plus the integral of the derivative squared against the area measure. Uh, the addition space B, of course, is of interest because it's uh, a Hilbert space and it's uh, part of a, um, a large class of spaces that have been studied uh, thoroughly by uh, Barbara McClure and, and, uh, and uh, Carl Cowan. Um, all spaces BP are Mobius invariant, as I said before. So this is of interest. Then there is another uh, uh, base of space, which is uh, the space B1, which is defined differently. It's, um, um, it's defined as a set of analytic functions, uh, which have a representation of the form uh, f of z equal to the uh, sum a n times these, um, uh, this cosmorphism w n minus z e over 1 minus w n bar z. Um, where the ans are summable and the uh, norm of this space is defined as the infimum of the L1 norm of the sequence an of coefficients in this representation um, taken all uh, overall such representation of f. So this is the smallest of all a Mobius invariant Banach spaces. And in fact, it's contained in, uh, in the space of uh, functions and analytic in D and continuous on the closure. And by a paper by Arazi, Fisher, and Peter, it was shown that the uh, elements of B1 can be characterized by. Uh, the, this integral condition, uh, the, the second derivative of the function has modulus, uh, which is um, integrable with respect to area measure. Um, so this is, uh, again, an attempt at making something that doesn't look very palatable, such as that representation I described on the previous page, which uh, is useful because it, it shows clearly that the uh, uh, the space is Mobius invariant to one that is not, uh, uh, does not give a norm that for which the uh, uh, norm remains in, uh, Mobius invariant, but it is easy to test out. And so this is an alternative um, non-Mobius invariant norm on the space B1. I'm still not sure about the, the reason for extending this to be one in such a peculiar way, but I've always been fascinated by trying to get as much of an understanding of all of this. And I, um, so I looked at the literature. And so the things that are well known about these spaces is uh, the following inclusion relations. The uh, alpha block spaces uh, where alpha is between zero and one are contained in, of course, the um, the uh, uh, space of bounded analytic function, which is contained in the block space, which is contained in all the alpha, uh, block spaces defined by a parameter beta bigger than one. So there is this uh, chain of inclusions and a similar chain of inclusions holds for the uh, uh, spaces uh, BP. So B1 is the smallest. And then if P is less than Q, BP is contained in BQ. The, the, all of these are contained in uh, BMOA, which is contained in, in the block space B. Um, all of these spaces are Mobius invariant. So B1 is the smallest and B, B is the biggest. Under, you know, there is something that should be added, but I, I, I won't discuss it here. Um, in addition, all the norms defined of these spaces uh, allow us to uh, see that the inclusions are proper and continuous. Um, now, 
what we, we uh, then looked at uh, the uh, what was known in the literature about extensions to harmonic uh, functions. So uh, the harmonic Hardy space uh, uh, Cal uh, HP is defined in a similar fashion, and and similarly for the harmonic Bergman space, because all you need is to have uh, replace the function uh, by uh, the new function, which is harmonic, and and so you can define the norm in an identical way on these spaces. So the, the translation is immediate. What isn't so obvious is what happens when you go from spaces um, such as these two spaces involved in derivatives, because obviously there is no obvious analog. Um, so these uh, have been studied um, by a number of, of authors, and there is a nice book on, uh, on uh, harmonic function theory uh, by Axel Bourdon and Remy uh, that uh, is a very useful reference. Uh, then uh, another space of uh, harmonic mappings has been considered is a BMOH. So this is uh, something that uh, was discussed at length in a, um, um, a, um, a series, a, a, a paper that was uh, published uh, after a series of talks uh, at the University of, of Vioenzu uh, by Daniel Girela, analytic functions of bounded mean oscillation. And so they are defined as um, the harmonic mappings, uh, uh, which, uh, which are Poisson integrals of functions in uh, BMO of the boundary. And the uh, norm is defined in a similar fashion uh, to the norm, where of course now the uh, Hardy space is replaced by the harmonic Hardy space. As far as we know, the study of harmonic spaces, um, we haven't been able to find any literature on other things. And so we uh, were trying to see what could be done uh, in, for the other examples that I mentioned. Um, one, uh, the starting point was a paper I, I wrote long ago in which I, uh, due to that characterization of uh, the um, uh, functions in the block space in terms of a Lipschitz number, um, that was one that could easily be translated into the language of harmonics uh, function. So we can define a function to be in the harmonic block space in a similar fashion since that definition involves just taking the function, the difference of the values divided by the uh, uh, hyperbolic metric, and um, and then uh, here we remind you the formula for the harmonic, uh, the expression for the hyperbolic metric. And it, it, in uh, in that paper, I I showed that you can express this uh, Lipschitz number in terms of the a, a formula that is a, a, a re, a resembles the and, and in fact reduces to the uh, analytic case uh, when the function is analytic. Um, so that is for the block space. So here, the instead of having the derivative, we have the um, partial derivative with respect to z in modulus plus the modulus of the uh, partial derivative with respect to z bar. And, um, and it, so then uh, my student worked on uh, generalizing this to the alpha block spaces in a similar fashion uh, and studied the, all the results that had been uh, uh, worked on by Zhu to see to what extent these could be extended. Um, so the norm uh, is defined in a similar fashion where this is the, uh, the semi-norm. And, um, and so the first observation is that uh, the semi-norm um, can be uh, written uh, are bounded above and below by uh, the semi-norms uh, sums of the semi-norms of the analytic and the conjugate analytic uh, functions associated with a function h. In other words, if h is, has, is a sum f plus g bar, where f and g are an analytic, then uh, the uh, 
seminorm of H is bounded above by the sum of the seminorms and, be and below by the uh, average of those, of the, of the, 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 the sum divided by two. Um, and so therefore there is this association of a, a harmonic mapping H is in the harmonic of, um, of a block space if and only if the analytic counterparts are in the uh, alpha block space. And so uh, the uh, extension of Zeus theorem can be proved that the uh, functions in the alpha uh, harmonic alpha block space can be identified with the Lipschitz functions defined in a similar fashion. So the characterization holds uh, also for the harmonic case. And, uh, and, so, and then for the uh, harmonic growth space, uh, which easily can be um, uh, translated into this setting by replacing the analytic with harmonic, it, the formula applies identical. Uh, then the question was, okay, so can we uh, in a similar fashion uh, obtain a, a theorem similar to the uh, other theorem of zoo for the case in which uh, alpha is bigger than one. Um, one thing is clear here is that if a function h is written as f plus g bar, where f and g are in the growth space a, a corresponding to the parameter alpha, then h is in the corresponding harmonic growth space. That's just triangle inequality. So then we were asking about the converse, and that is not obvious from the expression, but it turns out that using as a vehicle the Zeus theorem and the equivalence between the um, uh, seminorm of this uh, the relationship between the seminorm of H with the seminorms of the components, uh, the uh, it can it, we we get that a function uh, H of the form f plus g bar is in the uh, growth space if and only if f and g are in the corresponding uh, analytic growth space. And another result that is, 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 is turned out to be useful for us was uh, the uh, observation that uh, f plus g bar is in the growth space if and only if when you multiply f and g by a monomial z to the k. Actually, it's more general than this, but this is the one that I, uh, is relevant to this uh, presentation. Uh, and the conjugate of the monomial z to the k times g is also in, this, uh, in, a, in the growth space. Um, OK, now, um, then the harmonic Zygmunt space could be defined as follows. You take the uh, uh, collection of all harmonic mappings H, which, uh, for which the um, uh, partial with respect to Z plus the partial with respect to Z bar is in the harmonic block space. Um, this is uh, obviously a harmonic mapping because the, um, if you take the um, uh, second partial to get zero, so it, 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 it is um, the type that we've been dealing with. And so we can then uh, consider as norm one that is, looks very similar to the uh, case of uh, analytic where we have the sum of the uh, evaluation at zero plus the, uh, uh, the evaluation at zero of the partial derivatives, and then this term involving the second partials. Uh, so it's clear this is an extension of the uh, 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 classical Zygmunt space. And so then the question we wanted to discuss was, or try to figure out was, um, can the elements in the Zygmunt space, in the harmonic Zygmunt space, be characterized in a similar fashion? as those uh, that brought the study of the Zygmunt space to uh, 
in the first place, the original theorem by um, uh, Zygmunt himself. And it turned out that that is true. So uh, this took a, lo a lot of work to do. And so I, I don't know how I'm doing in terms of time. Um, let's see. Well, we are halfway, so maybe I do have a little time. Okay, so uh, one direction is trivial. So if uh, H is uh, in the, uh, Zig in the uh, uh, harmonic Zygmunt space, uh, and the G is normalized, so the G of zero equals zero, then uh, the two functions F and G uh, being analytic and with F and G being analytic, then F and G are in the Zygmunt space and the result follows from the Zygmunt theorem. So no problem there. But the converse is more complicated. So assume um, the, uh, this condition is satisfied. Okay, so this um, um, uh, smoothness condition on the boundary. Then um, we can um, uh, um, look at H of Z um, written in terms of the uh, uh, Poisson uh, kernel. So take the H of Z is the Poisson integral of its boundary H of E to the IT. Um, and, and so if we take the second derivative of the uh, Poisson kernel, which is um, one minus modulus of Z squared divided by E to the IT minus E modulus squared, and which can easily be written in terms of Z and Z bar, then we obtain expressions um, um, that lead to uh, the following representations uh, that the second partial with respect to Z is one over pi times the integral from zero to two pi of e to the it divided by e to the it minus z cube times h of e to the it and uh the the, the one for z bar second uh, partial with respect to z bar is similar but the uh instead of e to the it we have e to the negative it and the conjugate of z in the denominator but same type of expression more or less Um, since obviously the mean value of the Poisson kernel is one, uh, we can use that to represent uh, the value of H at a fixed point e to the i tau uh, in terms of the Poisson integral by writing the constant H of e to the i tau inside the integral. And, there, and then uh, if we uh, take the second partial derivative with respect to z and z bar, obviously we get that they are both zero. And so the, um, uh, do, uh, if we then combine the uh, formulas from the previous slide with these formulas that we get from, from the uh, constant value H of E to the I tau, we can represent H Z, uh, Z, um, in terms of similar way where uh, the integral now, besides having the term e to the it over e to the it minus e cube has the function e to the it minus h of e to the it minus h of e to the i tau and the corresponding one for the uh, z bar. Um, now, uh, some simple uh, manipulation allows us to see that um, um, making a, a change of variables, uh, we can rewrite uh, the second partial in terms of e to the i uh, t minus 2 tau divided by e to the i t minus modulus of z cube times a, an ex, uh, something that, pop, that, that is related to the expression that we are interested in using h of e to the i tau plus t minus h of e to the i tau. And for z bar, we have a similar formula. Um, however, we do have this extra term involving e to the i two tau plus t in the numerator. And, um, and here we have inside the parenthesis h of e to the i tau minus t. So uh, the, uh, then we can get something expressed in terms of uh, 
h of e to the i tau plus t plus h of e to the i tau minus t minus twice h of e to the i tau. Um, but uh, this involves having to multiply h z z and h z bar z bar by these factors uh, e to the 2i tau and e to the negative 2i tau. So we, uh, using this, we get an estimate that uh, allows us to obtain uh, the, this uh, modulus in terms of the uh, norm defined, uh, the semi-norm defined by the formula that we are assuming to be finite from the start, uh, times this integral, which can be estimated uh, in terms of um, this integral at the bottom of the slide. So this simple math here. Um, and then we make, it, 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 uh, we look if, if, at the case when modulus of z is greater than or equal to one half and less than one, and see that um, if we uh, rewrite e to the i tau as z divided by z bar, we can re rewrite the expression that we obtained from the previous page as follows, so modulus of z squared hzz plus z bar squared hz bar z bar, less than or equal to, there is this modulus of z, which obviously we can ignore because it's uh, less than one, um, times the expression we got from a previous page, which can be uh, majorized by pi times the norm of h, semi-norm of h divided by one minus modulus of z. Okay. So, then if we multiply by one minus modulus of z squared and take the supremum over all z uh, in be, uh, whose modulus is between one half and one, we see that with that function, uh, z squared hzz plus z bar squared hz bar z bar, uh, we have an upper bound um, dependent on that uh, semi-norm of h. Now we consider this function psi defined as z squared hzz plus z bar squared hz bar z bar, which is um, clearly bound in a compact set so that we can also get the quantity to be finite, obviously, inside the uh, this of radius one half. And so combining these two, we see that the function psi does um, belong to the group space um, uh, with parameter one. And so then using um, the, uh, the one of the corollaries that I gave you earlier, we get that we can essentially eliminate z squared and z, z bar squared because we, um, uh, we uh, that was exactly what that corollary was saying. That f plus g bar is in in the growth space, if and only if if you take z z to the k times f plus z bar to the k times g bar, then that is in the, in the growth space. So using that, we uh, get that uh, we can eliminate these z squares from the consideration, and so. Uh, from the characterization of uh, the uh, growth spaces, um, we get that both HZZ and HZ bar Z bar, bar are in the growth space uh, with parameter one. And so now we can <laughs> take the modulus of each of them and obtain that the supremum of the modulus of HZZ plus the modulus of HZ bar, Z bar times the uh, weight one minus modulus of z squared is finite because it's bounded by the, the uh, norms in the uh, growth space of both of these two quantities. And so that proves that the function is in the uh, uh, harmonic sequence space. Okay, so um, now I one last set of uh, um, um, spaces to consider are the harmonic base of spaces. So for p bigger than one, uh, the, uh, as done previously, we can use as a substitute uh, of the derivative, uh, the uh, sum of the moduli of the derivative and the, uh, with respect to z and the derivative with respect to z bar 
uh, raised through power p. Um, and, uh, and it's easy to see this is a, a Banach space under the norm defined in a similar fashion, which restricts to the uh, uh, analytic uh, base of space. Uh, but if we want to get an analog of uh, the um, uh, Dirichlet space, which is the special case for p equal to 2, um, we, um, which this fails to satisfy if we replace p by 2, then instead of using this, we uh, uh, could use another uh, formulation in terms of the, the sum of the p powers of hz and uh, modulus and the modulus of hz bar. Um, that does translate into a Hilbert space in a similar way. And in fact, it, it gives uh, a, 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 a direct connection with the components, uh, the analytic and the conjugate analytic uh, uh, parts of the functions being also in the Dirichlet, in the analytic Dirichlet space. Uh, what's interesting here is that even though these are defined in a different way, uh, these two um, semi-norms are Mobius invariant. Now, the case of B1 is a little more delicate. So, um, one that leads to a, an extension that we looked at first was the one in which, if you, from the theorem, uh, that uh, um, uh, by Arazi et al. Um, that gave the characterization of the functions in terms of the integrability of the second derivative. We replace the second derivative by the modulus of the second partial with respect to z plus the modulus of the second partial with respect to z bar. And so setting up this condition, uh, we were able to um, obtain a, um, uh, a Banach space and then uh, the that in which the components f and g uh, behave well in the sense that again the um, norm defined in terms of this quantity is bounded above and below by the corresponding sums for the component functions the, the norms are defined here and then so that led to uh, the conclusion that since we know uh, enough about B, the space B1 of analytic function, using that we can um, uh, reformulate B1H uh, uh, as the uh, collection of functions that admit a representation of the form An times phi uh, phi sub Wn plus the sum of Bn times the conjugate of these automorphisms phi zeta n, uh, where a n and Bn are L1 uh, sequences. And, and so we can also uh, obtain a Mobius invariant formulation of the space um, using a similar definition in which the infimum of the L1 norms replaced by the infimum of the sum of the L1 norms of the uh, uh, associated representation. Um, okay, so then composition operators. Now, very quickly, uh, uh, it turned out that the study of composition operators isn't that interesting on the, um, uh, these larger spaces. And I'm going to first highlight what people normally study when uh, dealing with composition operators and then uh, uh, highlight basically what is non-trivial in the setting that we looked at. Um, so a composition operator, of course, is defined as um, the um, operator with, uh, which maps a function uh, to the compo composite of that function with the so-called symbol of the operator, uh, here I call it. Uh, phi. Phi is a, an analytic self-map of the disk. And so uh, we w looked at the cases when um, the spaces in question are the growth spaces, the alpha block spaces, the Zygmunt space, and the uh, um, uh, uh, 
base of spaces, of course, in the harmonic case, and study all the issues related to boundedness, compactness, isometries, boundedness from below, close range, eigenfunctions, and spectrum. Those are the standard things that people look at. And uh, for many of them, it turned out that the, the, there is nothing new to discover. Uh, here, uh, just a quick reminder of what a bounded operator is. So it is bounded as an operator from a space X to uh, is a bounded space Y, um, if and only if the uh, norm of the image of T at each vector is uh, bounded by a constant times the norm of the vector and uh, compact if the image of the unit ball in the domain space is relatively compact in the uh, target space. Bounded from below if the uh, reverse of the definition of bounded holds, so the, the norm of Tx is greater or equal to a constant times the norm of x for all x for some constant independent of x, of course. Um, then close range means, of course, that the image is, the range is closed in the target space and isometry means norm-preserving. Uh, norm now for composition operators, being close range and being bounded below are equivalent. Uh, so I, we um, looked at all these issues and we found um, that due to the fact that there, the um, semi-norms are related uh, to the semi-norms of the uh, analytic components of the given harmonic mapping, uh, the boundedness on the extension is equivalent to the boundedness on the analytic uh, subset of the space in question. Similarly, for compactness, boundedness from below, and um, uh, close range, of course, as well. So this means that all the results that for our setting uh, on bounded composition operators on all the spaces we looked at can be uh, characterized in terms of conditions that have been discovered by the uh, uh, people who studied uh, boundedness on the analytic counterpart. And here there is a list of, of results, but I'm going to go fairly quickly over this. Um, it's already almost an hour from when I started, so I, I will leave uh, the details to you to read, but I want to jump over to the uh, part that is um, um, of interest. So the same applies to compactness. And for isometries, it's not so simple. It depends on the type. So one uh, uh, thing that we, uh, we know is that the isometries on almost every space turned out to be uh, induced by rotations. Okay. So this is true for the uh, uh, alpha block spaces, where but for alpha unequal to one, it's true for the uh, Zygmunt space, which is a result that uh, I proved with my uh, collaborator, uh, Nessie Medouche. Uh, and it's also true on the uh, uh, base of spaces. Um, but for, uh, th there are some exceptions. And so the, uh, the, the, the base of spaces, um, except for the uh, Dirichlet space. For the Dirichlet space, that's not the case. And, okay, so then there is the case of B1. So in the previous slide, we also uh, had the, only the case P bigger than one. So for the, the space B1, uh, it's, it's not clear what the story is entirely. If the symbol of the operator has a fixed point in the, in the disk, then um, the uh, composition operator is an isometry on B1 if and only if the symbol is an automorphism of the disk. And um, 
However, we don't know what your story is if uh, the symbol has no fixed point in D. So, and that's an open question to explore. In that case, the, the, there would be a, a, uh, a fixed point on the boundary, which is, and we don't know whether uh, the, the, there are any other symbols that induce uh, isometry in that case. Uh, the, the proof here is, is very easy here. It, it uses um, the fact that um, if, of course, if, he, if phi is an automorphism, then this, the composition operator is an is in isometry. However, if, uh, if we assume C phi is an isometry, then of course we can reduce the case in which this, the fixed point is the origin by making use of the Mobius invariance of the of the uh, norm. And so if, uh, of course, here I'm considering the Mobius invariant norm. Um, and, and if we were to assume that phi is not an automorphism, then it's not a rotation. And, and, and the sequence of either it's um, would have to converge to the fixed point locally uniformly, and which implies in particular that the uh, um, the uh, soup norms will have to go to zero, and therefore they will be uh, bounded by any number we want, so smaller than one half uh, for n large enough. So if we then take the uh, uh, composition operator uh, with symbol given by the iterates by sub n where n is chosen in this manner, then this uh, having a soup norm smaller than one half implies that the operator is, is compact on the block space and, and therefore also <laughs> compact on the smaller space B1. And then by a result of Johnny, uh, we know that since the sequence of monomials z to the k divided by k minus one of uh, k bigger than or equal to two is bounded in B1 and converges to zero local uniformly, then the uh, uh, B1 norm of the image under the operator will go to zero as k goes to infinity. Uh, on the other hand, if we um, use the fact that composing an isometry gives us an isometry uh, the uh, iterate phi sub n is also an isometry of B1. So the norm in B1 of phi sub n applied to BK will be equal to the norm of PK, uh, which is equivalent to the norm uh, defined in terms of the uh, second derivative, um, and which is easy to compute. And by doing the calculation of the second derivative of pk, we see that the value is equal to two. So therefore, we get a contradiction. So hopefully, one day I will know what the answer is about the general case in which uh, c phi is not uh, does not have a fixed point inside d. Um, now, for the Dirichlet space, the isometries. Uh, are precisely the composition operators uh, whose symbol is a univalent full map of the uh, and uh, uh, fix the origin. And this was proved in the analytic case by Martin and, and Vukotic, but it's not easy, uh, difficult to prove that this extends to the harmonic case. Uh, the one that is uh, the nastiest to study is the um, uh, composition operator uh, isometries on the block space, which turns out to be uh, uh, there is a very large class of such uh, uh, maps that are not uh, uh, rotations. And so um, uh, this is a collection of results that have been uh, obtained by several authors, um, most but the ones that I mentioned here are um, either my own or obtained from uh, jointly with uh, Cohen, which is the last one. Uh, so the a, a fun, a C phi is an isometry if and only if 
the symbol is a, has a block norm equal to one and fixes the origin. For all of them, fixing the origin is a requirement. Uh, so this uh, means that either the symbol is a rotation or there is a sequence of automorphisms which compose with phi approach the identity. Another characterization is in terms of the um, um, decomposition of the symbol as a product of non-vanishing analytic function and a Vlaschke product. So in the, in the non-rotation case. So uh, if I is an isometry, if and only if, besides the, the case when uh, phi is a rotation, uh, phi is the uh, product of a non-vanishing function G and an infinite Vlaschke product whose zero set contains a sequence that for, along which the non-vanishing part uh, goes to the boundary of the, of the disk and for which this condition holds, the limit of this infinite product over all um, uh, elements of the, of the zero set that are not equal to the sequence uh, is equal to one. So may, may, it looks difficult, but there are lots and lots of, of examples of functions that satisfy that, that condition. And, uh, they are known as a um, thin Blaschke products is a class of them, but there might be many more. Um, and then uh, is another characterization um, that I uh, uh, obtained here um, that says um, that in the non-rotation uh, case, for every point in the disk, there exists a sequence uh, approaching the boundary, z sub n. Uh, whose values are equal to A uh, under phi, uh, phi, and for which the limit of one minus Zn squared times the modulus of phi prime of Zn is one minus modulus of A squared. And that was what allowed us to uh, obtain an extension of this to the case of the uh, uh, harmonic uh, block space. Um, so the all functions that for which the uh, either phi is a rotation or uh, have this form uh, are all the isometries on the, uh, uh, so we can add this to our list. Uh, and this is, um, one direction is trivial, of course, rotation satisfy that. And uh, so going uh, in the opposite direction, so suppose phi has block norm one and fixes the origin. Then uh, if we pick a, a function that is in, uh, in the harmonic block state of norm one, and fixes the origin, uh, then uh, by definition of norm, uh, the condition um, tells us that the supremum of one minus modulus of z squared times the modulus of h sub z plus the modulus of h sub z bar is one, and therefore two possibilities uh, occur. Either this supremum one is attained inside the disk at some point A, that condition one here, or there is a sequence of points inside the disk approaching the boundary uh, whose limit of the same quantity um, is equal to one. In the first case, um, let Zn be a sequence going to the boundary uh, where uh, phi of the n is equal to a and for which this limit condition holds. That was the last one of the conditions that are equivalent that I explained on the previous uh, slide. Then it is immediate to see that by composing with phi, when we take the um, um, value 
um, um, of one minus Markley here. Uh, the, uh, if we take one minus modulus of Zn squared times the partial derivative of respect to Z of H composed with phi and evaluate at Zn and then uh, same for the conjugate and then carry out the derivative, we can factor out the modulus of the derivative of the symbol. And then since uh, the uh, one minus modulus of Zn squared times phi prime of Zn is one minus modulus of A squared, we obtain the um, one minus modulus of A squared times H sub Z A plus H Z bar A, which is one. And so this is uh, what happens in the limit. Um, and so, uh, that will give us what we're looking for in the first case. In the second case, the, uh, the argument is very similar, uh, except that we, here we have uh, a, another sequence associated with every element of the sequence C sub n of the previous case. So we have a sequence indexed by two parameters and we apply it to um, the each of the AKs in a similar fashion. Um, and then by arguing in a similar fashion, we obtain that the norm is, uh, on the one hand is one uh, from the assumption made, and on the other hand is uh, less than or equal to one, and therefore all the inequalities are equalities, and that tells us that we, uh, uh, the uh, norm of the uh, composite of H with the symbol is one. And therefore, um, that means that C phi preserves the norm because it, all you need to do is test them out on uh, of unimodular, uh, uh, I mean, uh, functions that have norm one, and that proves the result. Okay, how am I doing in terms of time? Uh, this is going beyond. Uh, usually, no, usually we would finish around five. So, okay, so maybe <laughs> this is a good time to stop. Then, yeah. uh, my apologies. For, I mean, there are so don't worry, don't worry. I didn't say anything about that. Was, it was it was a little thin in terms of what I presented because there was so much time spent going over uh, the spaces and giving at least some faint idea about what this was about, and I didn't realize that time was going so fast. So anyway skip over to the last page. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Claudia. Thanks. Uh, let's open for questions then. Uh, do you have any questions for Flavia? I'll, nope. I'll ask one question. Um, oh, okay. One of the things about harmonic functions that that is useful is that you can have them in any any Rn, like R three or R four or R five, and instead of analytic functions. Um, so, do do some of these results work in higher dimensions? Uh, I we haven't looked at that yet. So, uh, the, 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 uh, we uh, see. I'm. Um, I, I, I did a lot of work on harmonic functions in a potential theoretic uh, sense. So the study of harmonic functions in higher dimensions wasn't something I considered in terms of spaces because, you know, the motivation was just knowing what is known for analytic in the analytic setting and see what you can be extended. This is only the beginning of the study. So, I don't know much about the several variables case or, you know, going, uh, even in the complex case, I, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know whether, for instance, in, uh, you know, people work on so-called uh, pluriharmonic functions, you know, what, <laughs> don't know much. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm 
worked on some things related to analytic functions on the ball. I mean, that's the standard. Uh, and also other types of domains in CN. But RN is not an area I, I, I work on, I have to admit, but CN, yes. Uh, in which I studied uh, the block space in, uh, and things related to the block space in, uh, on a um, bounded symmetric domain, for instance. Um, that was something I did in the 90s or so. I haven't really looked at that recently. Um, but I, I, in recent times, all I, was, I did was work on uh, weighted composition operators. And as I said before, these are not really suitable for harmonic functions. Products don't behave well, so you can't use them. Uh, but yeah, several, several variables is definitely the next uh, step. Uh, if you have any knowledge of things that I should be looking at and you want to pass it along to me, I'd really appreciate it. Um, I have a, just a question about uh, uh, turplets operators. Ah. So is there any, um, is there, Anything of interest there at all? That is, um, I, don't, I don't know what sort of space you would look at, what the norm would be, but you've got a space of harmonic functions mm -hmm. and you multiply by a, well, something very general, uh, a bounded function. It's not going to be harmonic anymore, even if your multiplier were harmonic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you would, let's say you're in the Hilbert space case and you want to project back onto the harmonic functions. I don't know if there's anything interesting there at all. Uh, I wonder if you've thought about that at all? No. Uh, all I can tell you is that there is uh, the only other non-trivial uh, or, I mean, related to this, what I've been doing that I could have considered and I didn't really uh, do. Um, but it, it, it translates verbatim to, in, by making the appropriate changes um, to what I've done is uh, looking at the case in which the symbol is the conjugate of an analytic function. Mm -hmm. So of course that will work as well. And simply apply to the, each of the uh, analytic and conjugate analytic functions and you get that that would still give you a harmonic function. So, you know, there is no reason to limit ourselves to the uh, analytic symbols, but yeah, the uh, topics operators definitely one of the things that I plan to uh, get into if once I finish a series of things that I've been working on in recent times. And one of the problems when you have too many students, I didn't really have that many, but in the last three years I had three. And so you know, each of them working on different things and it becomes, okay, the, all, there are all these questions, you know, when are we gonna have time to devote to studying? Because obviously all of this requires also a great deal of studying and not just, uh, you know, uh, an easy change gear, at least not me. I, I really need to have a, a devoted, you know, one dimensional uh, environment to be able to function. And, and there is so much literature but yes, thank you for suggesting it. I definitely will look into it. Another thing I wanted to consider is uh, the analog of the uh, H2 beta, you know, for what regards um, harmonic functions. So how would you, I mean, the H2 beta treated in, uh, in the uh, Cowan McClure's book uh, uses this idea of taking a, a sequence beta n and considering uh, the functions that are square summable, again, that weight given by the sequence. Um, and so um, there ought to be some way you could do something similar, um, but it would involve having two separate series defined in a similar fashion. Maybe it would also be uh, fairly Ele uh, elementary in terms of not giving anything new. I don't know, but I suspect that 
uh, it may be just as simple as it is for the case of the uh, Dirichlet space. You see, so Dirichlet space is an example of a space like that, or even the um, the Bergman spaces are belong to the class of all such spaces. So um, I haven't looked, but you know, there are some interesting results in in that book that is, uh, you know, would be interesting to test out. Uh, you know, can you obtain all these uh, theorems? In, in, if you extend the set to include harmonic mappings, and that I haven't thought about, but definitely some 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 other thing to look into. Although that would only be for Hilbert spaces rather than uh, general balance spaces. Another thing that we've been thinking about and that we're, we're presently working on with uh, my former student is uh, um, this idea of how much. Um, for different spaces, very often it is the case that the characterization of boundedness, compactness um, have a, an a, involve an expression that if you know how to look with the appropriate lens, um, you can reconstruct what that formula comes from in a way that may, at least in case in which the target spaces are specific, um, so defined by a soup norm of sorts with the appropriate weight. Um, then, you know, is there a way you can come up with the uh, conditions on a general space of harmonic mapping um, that would give you for any such space? without having to single out the type or having to write down explicitly what the norm is, um, what the condition is for boundedness, compactness, and so on. So for example, in terms of the point evaluation for, uh, functions, you know, write an expression uh, that is related to how the symbol behaves uh, with respect to point evaluation functional associated with the domain space regardless of the environment you're in. So that's another thing that we've been looking at because we've done similar work um, with other students um, on the analytic case and a lot is known also for, for um, weighted composition operators. But for, for this type of setting, um, I, 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 it, it's gonna be difficult because some of the conditions uh, for the, with a composition operator case, for instance, um, you make use of uh, a condition that says if you multiply the uh, function by an automorphism, you get the norm, which is bounded by the norm of the, the function and so on. So there are conditions involving automorphisms also because you need some something concrete to be able to construct test functions that will allow you to, to reach this goal. And obviously multiplication is not an option for analytic, the analytic case. So we don't know exactly how that will pan out when we try to do something similar in the harmonic case. But thank you for the suggestion about the topic operators we'll stick about. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for a nice talk. Oh, thank you. Sorry for the glitches. You know, I always end up messing up when I talk. You, you have my sympathy. <laughs> Do we have more questions to Flavia? OK, if not, let me just ask you again. Thanks very much for accepting oh. the oh, invitation thank and you. thanks for the nice talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. We'll get in Maybe touch. next time can be in person. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely would. Since you are often in Washington,